Okay, here's where we left off last time. We were talking about standard deviation and coefficient of variation, and we did say in what cases it's better to have coefficient of variation as a measure of precision. Do you remember in which case we would rather go with coefficient variation than standard deviation? Quickly, can you remember? Okay, Grace? The size of mean, it depends on the size of the mean. When we're comparing methods and you have different uh, size of the average, one is a small average versus a large average, so it's always best to correct for the mean, and then you will get a percentage of coefficient of variation, and that would give you a better idea of precision. And we did talk a little bit about confidence of interval, and this is the interval uh, where you are sure at either 90% sure or 95% sure that your average lies within this range. Oftentimes, um, in analysis, we use 95% confidence, uh, but sometimes you do 90% confidence as well. So you would calculate the confidence interval using T value if you have less than 25 samples in replication or Z value if your observations are more than uh, 25 observations. And you multiply by what we call standard error. So uh, standard deviation divided by the root of, square root of your replication is your standard error. So this is where we left off last time. So let's bring back your sheet of paper that you were working on and let's do some calculations. Like I said, you really need to know the equation for standard deviation and also the equation of coefficient of variation and confidence interval. So you really need to know these. And for confidence interval, at 95% confidence, I'll give you the T value. You'll find the T, T value in your chapter, I'm going to give it to you. If I find the table. Okay, so how many replications do we have? We have three replications. So your degrees of freedom is what is your degrees of freedom if you have n equal 3? Do you remember from stat? 2. Yeah. So your degrees of freedom is 2. And you want 95% confidence. So when you're looking at the table, you look for the column that says 95%. And then the row that says degrees of freedom of 2. And then you'll get a T value of 4.30. So that's your T value for confidence interval. When you have values, you can raise your hand. Go ahead, Evan. That is the mean, correct? Do you have any other value? Okay. Standard deviation next. Anybody?
Yes, what do you have? Zero point zero two six. Nobody yet with a standard deviation. Are we all trying? What did you get, Ali? Yes, 0 0.0019. You can round it to 0 0.002. Um, usually, if you have four decimal points, you can keep it as four decimal points. We'll talk about all your significant figures later on. Um, CV? So basically, standard deviation, just apply the equation. Um, maybe you just need to learn how to use your calculator for square roots and stuff. Yeah, but it's a percentage. So you have to multiply by 100. So since your um, so it's standard deviation divided by the mean, really not the true value. So the standard deviation divided by the mean multiplied by 100, yes, Ali? 0.19%. OK. Anybody got into the confidence interval? There are multiple ways to report confidence interval. You can report it as a range from minimum value to highest value or your average plus or minus the, the actual coefficient interval, or the confidence interval. So you would need the t value for that. It's good that you practice with your calculator. Anybody got a confidence interval? Yes, you're Megan, right? Oh. Who, where's Megan? Who's Megan? Don't we have a Megan? Oh, yeah. Hi, Megan. I confused you between you and Lauren. And now two Laurens sitting next to each other, right? OK, good. What did you say, Lauren? OK, so you actually subtracted and added. What was your value for the confidence interval itself? 0. 0. 0.00? Yeah, OK. Yes, or 48, depending on how you round it. So you can re report the confidence interval as plus or minus the confidence interval, or you can have the range from the average minus this and the average plus this value. OK, it's just applying the equation. And you're going to practice applying the equation next week in lab. So, And you would need to know these equations. You might get questions in a quiz to calculate. All right, so we have so many different sources of errors. And we keep discovering them every time we run a lab. New sources of errors just show up. 
So you do have a list of sources of error with more details for the lab. You'll find that on Canvas, and you'll be given a hand handout next week as well. But they're categorized into different types of errors. So these are the main category. Systematic error, you're always getting the same error. So you are very precise. You're getting great coefficient of variation, but you're way off in your accuracy because you're just always having the same error. And one big example of that, if you're using a mechanical pipette, and it's not calibrated, so you're instead of pipetting 1 ml, exactly 1 ml, you're always consistently pipetting 0 0.9 ml, not knowing that's what the pipette is giving you. So that is called a systematic error. Same with the balance. If the balance is not calibrated, it will always give you wrong off reading. So this is systematic. Random error can be anything, really. That's why it's called random error. It could be you as an experimenter, or it could be using different balances, for example. So random error is the most common type of error, and we usually call it experimental error. It can come from you not knowing how to use a pipette, for example. It can come from you not reading accurately when you're titrating the uh, the reading off of the pipette or the burette, um, not seeing where that um, tangent line is to your, I don't know what you call that layer of the solvent. So the, this is kind of random error. We will run through a lot of them in the lab. A blunder is a complete mess up. So you have prepared 0.1 normal NOH instead of 0.01 normal NOH, and then your titration is way off. Or you are titrating with a base with a base instead of base with an acid. So you will never see a change in color. So, or using the wrong reagent altogether. So that we call blunder. And sometimes we call it Monday morning blunder. A lot of the blunders happens on Monday morning. So, but basically it's a complete mess up. And the experiment will not go right. So here's just a question to differentiate specificity, sensitivity, and detection limit. So which of the following implies sensitivity? I know I talked about sensitivity last time. So if you remember, which one would match sensitivity? Yes, Ted? C. OK. So sensitivity is the detection of a minor change in constituents. So if you have samples that differ in 0.05% glucose, is your absorption or detection method that you're using will allow such a small difference to be detected, which is different than threshold uh, or detection limit. Detection limit or, or threshold means what's the lowest concentration yet that you can detect or measurement that you can detect uh, with confidence. And detection of only one constituents would indicate what? Specificity of the method. Okay. You'll be producing a lot of standard curves. Some of you are already familiar with standard curve. Others, this concept might be new. So you will be uh, determining concentration of caffeine in different beverages by plotting a standard curve of caffeine using standards of caffeine. Uh, you are going to determine the amount of total carbohydrate uh, in some beverages also by plotting glucose standard curve. You will be determining protein content uh, using Bradford assay. You're also going to plot a standard curve. Minerals using AA, you're going to plot standard curves. So you're going to be plotting a lot of these standard curves. So let's just go over what they do. They're used to determine unknown concentration. So we use standards 
uh, we prepare standards at different concentration, and then we run a measurement. The measurement could be HPLC and get detecting the area under the curve of your peak, and that would be your measurement, or it could be an absorption uh, measurement that you would use spectrophotometer for it. So we'll use the measurement and the concentration, plot the curve, and then run an unknown sample, get the measurement, and use the equation of the line to get the concentration. When we're using standard curve, often in food analysis, we use uh, linear curves. So the concentration must be proportional to the measurement and often linear relationship. So by proportional, we mean it, the concentration or the measurement changes when the concentration changes. And like I said, it's often linear regression is what we use to construct the curve for determination of concentration. So linear regression, you have your independent variable, which is your x-axis, and that's your concentration of your standards. You will know the concentration of your standard. You actually prepare your concentration of your standards, so you know what they are. So they are your independent variable. Your dependent variable is the measurement which is the y-axis. So are we looking at absorption? Are we looking at area under the curve? That would be your y-axis. Then you have the correlation coefficient would tell you how well your data is correlated and how well it fits a straight line versus co coefficient of determination, which is your r-squared, which tells you how much the measurement is explained by the regression or the equation of the line basically, the linear equation of the line. <coughs> how, how good is your prediction of the concentration using that particular equation of the line? So here's an example of a standard curve, bovine serum albumin, B BSA stands for bovine serum albumin, uh, which is a protein from milk. And we use it often as a standard to determine protein concentration using various different assays. So in this situation, you, you have the standard, you prepare several dilutions, and then you will have different concentrations. And then you react it with a reagent. For example, in the lab, you react it with Bradford uh, reagent. And then you will measure absorption as a particular wavelength. We'll talk about absorption and wavelength in spectroscopy when we get to that. And then what you would do, you would have several standards, you run them all, and then you plot the absorption that you've gotten over the concentration, and you obtain um, equation of the line and your R-squared. The higher the R-squared, the better your prediction is going to be of the concentration of your unknown. So 0 0.989 is pretty good. Uh, the closer to 1 it is, the better. And then what you would do is when you run your sample, your sample will have an absorbance of 1.5, let's say. You substitute Y with the absorbance, and then you solve for X. And you get the concentration. Now you'll be doing that quite a bit, like I said. So significant figures, there's, um, this is where it gets sometimes confusing. There are general rules. and. There are times where you have to consider the sensitivity of your measurement tool, and sometimes you have to have exceptions of the rule. Uh, so I'm going to give you examples about general rules, which are very simple, um, but it's not always applicable. So I have a few examples here to share with you to remind you of your long forgotten math or physical science in school. All right, so how many significant figures are there here? Melissa? No, Mar Marissa, not Melissa. Go ahead. Four. All right. How many significant figures here? Go ahead, Sam. Three. So when you have zeros after the decimal point, 
that's three significant figures, one, two, three. So if you have, do we have three? One, Zach, right? We have one. So zeros to the left don't count unless there is a number here. Unless you have this. If there is a number here, then how many significant figures do we have? Four. So we have four here. So if I have 0.9961, how many significant figures do I have? Four. This zero does not count. Sometimes you can write this number as like that without having anything here. But this can be confusing. People would think, did you forget a zero or did you forget another number? So it's better always to write it with a zero and consider these four as significant. So one thing I want to point out, which will be confusing for next week's lab, is you are going to weigh out water in the lab. And you're going to use different scales. Some of the scales will measure up to four decimal points. Okay? You are going to get readings with four decimal points. Which of these are significant versus accurate? Or you're sure of or certain of? How many digits you, th you are certain of? Yeah? Three. This is rounded. Okay? So you are certain of those three, and this one is rounded. It could be two, it could be zero. So, yet four are significant figures. Okay? All right. So, what else? So, if you have. If you're reporting a number like this, 7,000 units, whatever is unit, unit. So what, how many significant figures do you have? One. If you're reporting it like this, how many significant figures do we have? Say that. Five. You have five. We added a, a decimal and a zero. That means you have five. If I want to present this as an annotation like that, if I do 7 times 10 to the 3, this means I have one significant figure. But if I have five significant figures, I want to do this. So you would count, you put your zeros after the decimal based on how many significant figures you want to account for. I'm still with general rules here, so bear with me. OK, are we all good here? I can move to this side. Should I turn on the lights, or is this good? We're good? All right. So let's say we're doing multiplication. You're always going to be multiplying, dividing, adding. So you're going to be, do a lot of these types of calculations. So you have 3, 6, 5, 4 times 2, 3, 8 times 1.1, 1 .1, for example. So you're going to end up with 9, 5, 6, 6.172. Are you going to leave it like that? No. Do not put such a number in your table of results. OK, so what will you report it as how many significant figures, Nathan? Two. So you got this, these two, right? So the lowest significant figure, then you would get nine. Yeah, you can do 9 is like that, or 9.6 times 10 to the 3. So let's say you're adding. You're adding numbers. So this applies to whether you are adding, you are subtracting, you are dividing. But when you are actually, when you have decimal points, there are different rules for adding and subtracting. So when you are adding and you have decimal points,
Okay, so you're going to get a value of 16.175. How would you present that value? Sam? In this case, you would want two decimal points. So the lowest decimal point in your uh, calculation. So it would be 16.18. And that you apply whether you are adding or subtracting when you have decimal points. So you go with the lowest decimal point. So another thing, another example I have for you Let's say you are calculating um, concentration of your caffeine and you have done 50 times dilution. You took 1 ml and you made up to 50 ml using a volumetric flask, let's say. Um, so, and then you measured caffeine in this diluted sample and you got 43 0.5 micrograms per milliliter caffeine. That is in your diluted sample, which was diluted 50 times. You want to go back and calculate um, the actual con concentration of, ca of caffeine in your actual sample. What would you do? You're diluted 50 times, so what would you do to get the concentration in your original sample? Do you multiply by 50? Do you divide by 50? What do you do? No. Alex, what do you do? <laughs> it's diluted. Yeah. You dilute it 50 times, basically. Yeah, and then you measured your sample that is diluted 50 times and you got this. So you want the original before dilution, so you multiply by 50. Okay, so if you multiply by 50, how many significant numbers I have here? One. Hmm. So your value, which will turn out to be 2175, you will have to report it as 2,000 microgram per ml. Gosh, what did you do to your sensitivity of your method? You tanked it, basically. We can't, we can't do that. Uh, what, you, what you will go and think about, okay, this 50 came from a volumetric flask. What is my accuracy and sensitivity of that volumetric flask? It reads, it's accurate to 0.05. Then I'm just going to say, okay, I can trust this value here. 0 0.05, the 5 is rounded. So I can trust this. So I can trust the sensitivity up to the first point after the decimal, or first digit after the decimal. So now, instead of having 1, I'm now with 3. So this number can be, Two one eight zero. So now I enhance the sensitivity of my method again by taking into account the tool I have used. Okay, exceptions of the rules. There are many exceptions of the rules. Um, oh, I wanted to also say, and we'll talk. We'll remind you in the lab too. Next week, you will be determining averages, right? You have six replications. Then you're going to divide by six. Six, six is the number of replication. You shouldn't account, and it's only one significant figure. So, in reporting of your results, you don't account for the number of replications when you are uh, determining your average. So, keep that in mind, and we'll talk about it in lab next week. Okay, so exceptions of the rules, we'll have labs where you're going to get numbers that are very large and very small, lots of, signi lots, lots of decimal points, and how are we going to deal with that? An example is the GC, and Cindy would probably be better than me giving you that example of the area. <laughs> me. Okay. <laughs> 
try and see if I got what Cindy told me correctly. OK. So in the GC data uh, output, what you get, you get a chromatogram. And we'll learn about chromatograms when we cover uh, gas chromatography. But in GC, for instance, you're going to get a chromatogram of fatty acids. You'll be analyzing the content of fatty acids in oils. So you're going to get a chromatogram. We call it a chromatogram because it comes out of a chromatograph. And each constituent will be represented by a peak. Uh, but yeah, and we'll talk about peaks later. So you're going to get probably a fatty acid that is abundant in really large amounts. So you'll get a peak with re really large area. And then you're going to get another fatty acid that is present in small amount. Of course, you're going to get many more fatty acids, but just so here you're going to get an area of I don't know, Cindy. What what unit? What what number? Give me a number. Eight hundred fifty thousand unit area. And then this one might be what seven hundred seven fifty. And and then what, Cindy? <laughs> And then what? Oh, here. Yeah. Right. Oh, six, five, eight, nine, one, and this one. Yeah, four, three, five, nine, zero, one, whatever. And then you need to, and then you will be adding all of these areas up, and then you get the percent relative area. Then you would have to get this percent relative area of this out of a total that could be a million and 975 whatever with 78910 decimal point so you'll be dividing this by this and you get whatever you get at that point we really have to be um, you know, not necessarily go with the rules. We have to maintain some sort of sensitivity based on what the output is giving us, but at the same time be reasonable in the number of significant figures. So there is no need at all to report all these decimal um, points. So you might at this point say, okay, I'm going to stick with four significant figures and then just round these last two here. Right, Cindy? Yeah, that will work. So basically, for every lab, you might end up with different tool, different sensitivity of each tool, different sets of numbers. Come to us, and we can guide you through, OK, this is an exception of the rule in this case. Let's go with four significant figures in your results. OK? All right. So another thing that I talked about last time briefly is rejecting a data based on a Q test. So in this case, uh, you might ha you will run a caffeine lab, and one group will have four replications, let's say, or five replication. And then let's say you did five because you're five in a group. I don't know how I forgot how we set it up, but let's go with five replications. And then four of the data points are close to each other, and one is far off. It's just messing up your precision, messing up your accuracy. What do you do? Well, just look at it and say, no, eyeball it. I'm throwing this data point out. No, don't eyeball it. You have to actually run a test. So if this happens with your data set, you can run the Q test. And in your discussion, you mentioned that you did that and that you removed one data point, And now your precision is much better and your accuracy is much better. So how do we determine Q tests? It's simple. You look at your data set. And um, you go, OK, the x1 here is the value that is way off, either very low value or very high value uh, compared to the rest of the data. And then you go, the x2 is your value that is closest 
to that weird number. So the value in, of your data set that is closest to that off number. And then you divide by the range of your data, maximum minus minimum, and you get a value. That value you compare to a tabulated Q value. The tabulated Q value, you have a table on page 57. And usually we call it Q of rejection. It's not at 90% confidence. And number of observations. So there is a column for number of observation and a column for the Q uh, value. So let's say here, in, in this case, you have five observations. So you go to uh, five, and then you select the Q value from that table, and if your calculated value is greater than the tabulated value, then you reject that data point. So remember, calculated greater than tabulated, you reject that value. So here are a few recap questions. I usually have them if I stop the lecture and come back. Uh, but do look over these when you're studying to see if you have uh, captured um, most of the what's covered in this lecture. We already, you already by now know the difference between accuracy and precision. So I did mention it a couple of times already. Uh, we just talked about threshold and sensitivity. Do not confuse these two. They're very different. Um, and we talked about what, when we use CV versus standard deviation. And like I mentioned last time, remember in the lab, we'll be comparing different food samples to each other using different methods. So you have different means. So always we ask you for CV rather than standard deviation to compare precision. But you definitely need to calculate standard deviation in order to get to the coefficient of variation. We talked about systematic versus random error. An example of a blunder, we gave that already. And significant figures, something to remember, and Q-test. So these are key kind of questions to ask yourself when you're studying. OK, so for lab uh, next week, you're going to be doing a lot of uh, measurements of water using different tools in the lab. So some of you are already familiar with some of these tools, given that they worked in a lab before. Others, it could be a refresher. And for some of you, completely new. So what we will learn is how to use different balances that have different digits, reads to different digits, um, whether they're analytical balance or top loading balance, mechanical pipettes versus volumetric pipettes or graduated pipettes, volu volumetric flasks, beakers. We're going to use all of these and determine if they are to contain or to deliver. And we're going to assess the accuracy and precision of your data by doing three replications or six replications and we're going to discuss the data. Uh, please read chapter four in your book. Be helpful. Review this lecture. It's recorded. Lab two uh, in your lab manual. I think it's chapter, is it chapter two, Cindy? I don't know if I updated this in your, um, because there's a new version of the lab manual. Anyway, the chapter that says accuracy and precision in your lab manual. You have lab safety and sources of errors already. Uh, documents are already present on Canvas. Please review this. We we'll go over them in lab. And there will be a pre-lab quiz, again, to complete. You need your lab manual. So it's um, another exercise using the lab manual. And bring your lab notebook with you. Bring calculators and laptops. You're, sometimes we're going to enter data in the lab. So when I say, please bring your laptop, it would be great to have yours. If you don't have yours broken or anything, we have some laptops that you can lend in the lab or borrow in the lab. So please, um, each person, all well, you're going to be working in groups, each person will need to enter their data individually. So bring your own lab. Laptops and come on time. So that is lab for this 
uh, section. I'm going, I have five minutes, so I can introduce the next topic. It's not Friday. If it was Friday, I will send you home five minutes early. Okay. Sampling and sample preparation. I'm, I don't mean to make it smaller. I just mean to do this. Okay. This is chapter five. So when you're analyzing food, sometimes sampling is more important than the actual procedure in terms of errors. So if you make errors in sampling or uh, miss sample or not prepare your sample in an adequate manner or store it adequately, then your results are off. So sampling and sample preparation in many cases is more important in considering experimental error than the actual procedure that you use to analyze your sample. So this is very critical. That's why we learn about it. Okay, so to determine food quality and acceptance, it is essential to monitor the composition and characteristic of the whole lot of a food product or raw ingredient. Evaluate a sample or set of samples of a lot and then decide to accept or reject a particular lot. Determine sample size. In this case, sample size doesn't mean the weight of the sample or the amount of the sample. It means the number of samples you pull out for testing. That's the sample size. How many samples you're going to pull out to analyze. And selection of protocol based on factors such as the nature of the product and the purpose of the inspection. I'm waiting for a volunteer. We have three minutes to wait. Grace. So you're going, let's say you have a whole truck of wheat grains. And you want to determine protein content. Are you going to determine? Oh, sorry. BC. BC. Yeah. OK, then that's a better answer. Yes, B and C. It depends on the analysis. Sometimes you do monitor the whole lot. Let's say you're determining metal, you're doing metal detection, and then you're putting your whole grains on a belt and they go under and be scanned or have a magnet to determine metal, uh, presence of metal. So sometimes it's not completely impossible if the method is non-destructive and automated. You can still do it, but oftentimes you select a sample or a set of samples and you run the analysis to determine whether you accept the whole lot or reject the whole lot. And there are different ways of doing that, and that's what we're going to talk about. And depending on the nature of the product and the purpose of the inspection, is it for nutrition labeling, is it for quality control, you would determine how many samples you need to analyze. And uh, based on the nature, is it a homogeneous sample, a heterogeneous sample, then that will determine how you're going to, uh, how much uh, what would be the sample size and what would be the selection protocol. For sample preparation, you might not know this, but give a wild guess. Uh, for analysis, we need to reduce the size of the particle size so that you have a larger surface area. So do you know what the mesh is? When we say 20 mesh, do you know what that is? 20 squares in one linear inch of a mesh. Not square inch, linear inch. How many openings do you have in one linear inch? So the higher the number, the smaller those uh, openings are. That means the smaller the particle size will be after you grind and sift them. So all types of analysis particle size should be reduced to 20 mesh. 
uh, enzyme activity should be eliminated. Lipid oxidation should be prevented. Is this all correct? Logics might tell you yes, but in this case, this is not particularly correct because some you need a smaller size, like if you're doing extraction, especially for fat extraction, you really need a finer uh, particle size, so you would use a 40 mesh to determine, uh, to extract fat. And we'll talk about that more. Definitely you don't want the sample to change in composition or in characteristic, because that's going to screw your results. It would just make, if, you, if you're lipid oxidized, then you have different types of fatty acids at the end. Um, or uh, you might have off flavor. If you're measuring flavor and you get lipid oxidation, you will have different off flavor. So you don't want your enzymes to be active. It will break down your protein, you break down your lipids. So definitely you want to avoid any changes during sample preparation and storage so that it will not impact your results. All right, I'll let you go. Yeah? Yes, turn in your uh, piece of paper for extra credit.